Hey there, Plant Strong Pod Squad. We have just announced our fall 2023 Plant Strong Retreat in mm, incredible Sedona, Arizona. And I want to personally invite you to join us in a memorable week steeped in intimate connection, deep discussions, bountiful plant based buffets restful recharge, and lots and lots of laughs. Let us do all the cooking while you sit back and press the reset button. Visit plantstrong.com and click the Sedona Retreat from the main menu or send us an email at events at plantstrong.com and we'll be sure to send you all the details. I hope to see you soon in the Red Rocks of Sedona, Arizona. Ever since we started our plant-based journey about eight years ago, your dad is sort of a rock star in our house. Yeah. You know, like he, he's so featured in so many of the things that, not just us, but I think that when you're, when you're taking that step and you're really getting into it, um, he just pops up and he's sort of this voice of reason and a very comforting uh, figure to, to pay attention to and trust. And uh, like if his, if he's involved in something, it, lends tremendous credibility and then because of that you know we became aware of your sister and you and so i'm thrilled to be chatting with you i'm rip esselston and welcome to the plant strong podcast the mission at plant strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement we advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands promotes and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plant Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. My rock star guest today likely needs no introduction because he has been on the music charts since the 1980s when he was 18 years old. In fact, you may know Richard Marks from some of his biggest hits like Hold On to the Night, Don't Mean Nothing, Endless Summer Nights, and Right Here Waiting. He's the only male artist in history to have his first seven singles reach the top five of the Billboard charts, and three of those were number ones. But in addition to those timeless chart toppers, he is also a crazy accomplished songwriter, having written hits with stars like Keith Urban, Kenny Loggins, Madonna, In Sync, Luther Vandross, and many more. Recently, my podcast producer saw some photos and videos of his recent tour down under in Australia, and she was like, Hmm, my goodness, he looks so incredible, so vibrant, so full of energy on stage. I wonder, I just wonder if he might be plant-based. Sure enough, she did a little digging and it didn't take long for her to learn that Richard and to boot his wife, Daisy Fuentes, are both plant-strong baby and I just had to talk with him about it all. And what a beautiful conversation this is. Today, he shares the pivotal moment when he and Daisy decided to go all in plant strong. He also talks about his favorite meals and why it's important to be vocal advocates of something that they believe in so much. Of course, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk about his music career and some of the magical moments and experiences he's had over the last 40 plus years. What a gracious and thoughtful human he is. I know you're gonna love it as much as I did. Please welcome Richard Marks. All right, hey, Richard Marks, I wanna thank you for being on the Plant Strong podcast. Really appreciate it. Rip, it's my pleasure, man. Um, so Richard, I have to tell you how um, we kind of stumbled upon having you on the podcast. So my podcast producer, 
Carrie Barrett. She has a good friend who said that she just saw you in Australia. I guess you you were on tour there. And so Carrie was flipping through your Instagram and she's like, my God, this guy looks like a million bucks. How could he be so good looking and almost be 60 years old? Good filters, (laughs) man. (laughs) And so uh, I kid you not. She's like, I bet you, I bet you he's plant-based slash vegan. And so she did a little research, found out. She obviously uh, emailed your publicist and then you agreed to come on the show. So thank you. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Rip. And, uh, you know, I, Daisy, my wife and I both follow you, but, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard this before, but um, ever since we started our plant-based journey about eight years ago, your dad is sort of a rock star in our house. Yeah. You know, like he, he's so featured in so many of the things that not just us, but I think that when you're, when you're taking that step and you're really getting into it, um, he just pops up and he's sort of this voice of reason and a very comforting uh, figure to, to pay attention to and trust. And uh, like if his, if he's involved in something, it, lends tremendous credibility and then because of that you know we became aware of your sister and you and so i'm thrilled to be chatting with you yeah well thanks and i can tell you that yeah my father is he's uh he's got such an amazing sense of ethics of honesty uh, clearly and just authenticity very stoic um, but also very courageous, right? To be yeah. such a disruptor and go down this path, start, you know, back in 1984, he started his research. So I have, I've always looked at him as one of my big heroes. That's great. In my life. So thank you for, for, for mentioning that for sure. Uh, you just finished a tour in Australia. How was it down under? You know, I think it was, uh, I've lost count, but I'm going to guess that this tour was my 12th tour there over, you know, since I started back in 1911, um, <laughs> uh, 12th or 13th. And now that doesn't um, account for all the times I've been there to do promotional stuff or television shows, or uh, I've actually spent time in Australia just hanging out. And a dear friend of mine, who's a sort of legend in Australia is a singer named John Farnham, the biggest selling recording artist in the history of Australia. He and I became friends many years ago and I went and wrote some songs with him for an album he did years ago. And so I've spent a lot of time there. I I have a lot of friends there. Um, Daisy had never been to Australia when she met me uh, 10 years ago. And she's now, this was her fourth trip there. So I go there a lot. This tour, I don't know, Rip, there was something, I can't even put my finger on what was different but there was just sort of extra. It's always great to play in Australia. They're some of the best fans in the world. Um, you know, as you go around the world, there are certain places where, like Japan, for example, they're great fans. They're loyal fans, but they aren't generally wild. You know, I think part of it is the culture. Um, they, they're they not the kind of audiences who generally like push up to the front of the stage and get up and dance and scream and whistle. And and that's the kind of audience I love the most. Um, South America does that. They're like um, wild, they're crazy, but Australia is always a party. And there was just some extra level of awesomeness on this tour. It was just a total joy. We did nine, nine cities, nine shows, and it was just the, the best. Well, and you've been doing this since what, 1987? Is that when you first started? Yeah, that's when I started touring. Yeah. And has it lost any of its luster? Or when you're <laughs> up there, is it just like, is it magical? Is it work? W- what is it? It's all those things. It's, uh, it's a job, but it's the best job. I think I have the best job in the world. Yeah. And I've said this for many years, you know, I get, I get paid for the 22 hours that I'm not on stage. <laughs> The, yeah. the, the two hour show is always a blast, even if there are technical issues or, you know, things happen like in any profession, there are, there are ups and downs or there are highs and lows. Um, I, I'm never not aware of how good I have it. 
And the fact that after 30, Jesus, 37 years, whatever, I've, since I've been doing this, almost, well, 36 years, uh, <clears throat> for me to still be able to tour around the world, to still have the opportunity to put out new music through a major label, I'm a very lucky guy. I'm very, very grateful for my career, maybe now more than ever. Yeah. But it's also, I, but I'm at a point in my life and in my career, but in my life particularly where I don't take any of it as seriously as I used to. Just so fun. And so there's just a lot of joy surrounding what I do when I'm on the road. You know, Daisy's with me most of the time. Um, I've got a really great crew. I do a lot of shows solo acoustic. So a lot of times on the road, it's just me and my tour manager and my sound guy. Um, but when I'm out with the band, like in Australia, again, like it's a, it's a really wonderful unit of great human beings. And so it's not just the, the, the work that we're getting done. It's the hang it's, we're having fun. Um, you know, I have a martini on stage every night and I'm just having a blast. And this was, uh, this was an amazing tour. I'm going to just cut for a sec. It seems like something happened to our audio, Carrie. Do you oh, wait, cut out. I lost your audio. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Oh, hang yeah. on. I, just, yeah, I, it's almost like your mic switched to speaker. No, what happened was that I must have said something that sounded like S I R I and she oh. just jumped in. She okay. did. That's that was so, she's so nosy. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so you were waxing poetic and neither one of us wanted to interrupt. Damn it. Okay. No, 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 no. Hey, this is all going. Just it's all right. <laughs> this, this, this is like one of this what happens on the road, happens. Just it's all right. No, uh, all right. I'm gonna disappear again. Yeah. Okay. Uh so how long were you in Australia? About a month? This tour was a little over three weeks. Yeah. Wow. Now, after a three week tour, are you, are you toast? Do you have to like wind down for a couple of weeks? No, generally after a three week tour, I'm like ready to, you know, a couple of days and I'm ready to go do the next, but this is the, the sort of culmination of a pretty much nonstop seven months. Uh, starting the end of last summer, I went to Europe and, and played 27 shows in Europe over a couple of months and then came home for like a week and then did a bunch of U.S. dates. Um, it's been a like crazy amount of touring in the last six or seven months. And I'll be honest with you, for the first time in my life, I, I said to a couple of my friends, I was like, you know, this is a little harder at 59 than it is than it was at 29. I'm not going to lie. I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't have been. But but you are playing strong. Right. Yes. You yes. are. And, and, and so I'd love for you to share with the audience. What was it that I think you said it was about seven years ago, eight years ago, yeah. that kind of really um, cemented in your mind that, you know what, this is a lifestyle that I want to check out. Well, I'll, I'll try to give you the reader's digest version of my yeah. journey. Um, you know, it, it was a little bit easier transition for me than Daisy, for example, my wife. My wife was born in Havana and moved to Spain when she was three, lived in Spain until she was about 11. And then she grew up uh, in New Jersey. And she grew up like a lot of Cubans, uh, a heavy meat eater. You know, she was, that was a big staple of her diet. And she's a foodie, she's a great cook. I stopped eating red meat when I was 18 years old. I don't exactly remember why. I think uh, it wasn't like anything called out to me to stop eating red meat. It was, I think it was really more accidental. I, I, it's the year I moved away, I graduated from high school. I had planned to go to college and then I got an opportunity to come to LA and work with Lionel Richie on his first solo album. And it sort of was the beginning of my career. And I moved from Chicago to LA and I think it was really just a, a, a function of being so busy that I wasn't eating much of anything, uh, running from session to session and just the, the newness of being out, you know, away from home for the first time. And, and I think it had been like a month or so. And I realized 
that I hadn't had any red meat. I wasn't a huge meat eater, but I would, you know, I'd have a burger or a patty melt, whatever. But I had, I realized that I hadn't eaten any red meat in about a month and I could tell that I felt better. And this is at 18 and I was pretty fit. I was pretty healthy. Um, didn't think much of it. One day soon after that, I ordered a burger somewhere and I thought I was going to die. I, I, I had horrible stomach cramps and I just thought, you know what? That tells me everything I need to know. I'm going to not eat any red meat. And so I cut red meat out. Soon, maybe it was another few years, I, I slowly cut out poultry. And then for about the next 25 years, I was pescatarian. Hmm. Um, and the only, and the reason that I went from pescatarian to plant-based was we had, Daisy and I had seen several documentaries, you know, some of which your, your father is in. You guys are a big part of a lot of these great documentaries that we were, it piqued our curiosity about going plant-based. But for me, the pescatarian, the, the thing that put me over the edge was this movie called Blackfish. And it's not even really about health or diet or it's, a, it's, it's an expose on SeaWorld and, and, and the orcas and the treatment of these whales, these beautiful creatures. And I was watching this and there's a particular moment, you've seen it, right, Rip? I have. Yeah, yeah there's, a real, there's a particular moment in the movie where they pluck a baby orca out of the water and the family, of the, the, the family of whales won't disperse and they start crying, like literally wailing, that's the term. And it's a really emotional, tear-jerking moment. Yeah. And it clicked in that moment when I was watching this movie. I thought, what's the, I'm feeling so horrible for, for this this family of species, right? And I said to myself, what's the difference between this and the salmon that I ate last night at the restaurant? Yeah. That was the moment for me. It was like, I can't participate in this anymore. And so Daisy was ready to, to make that transition too. And so we literally that night, we just said, yeah, we're going plant-based now and see how that goes. And we never looked back. Wow. And... So no major challenges for the most part since you had kind of been heading in this direction since 18? Not for me. It was a little, I mean, it wasn't really tough for Daisy. It was a little more tough. It was a little more of an adjustment for her. Um, like I said, she's a foodie. And one of the challenges for her that went from a challenge to a journey and, and uh, an adventure was replacing her favorite dishes as a chef with plant-based alternatives mm -hmm. and so you know all of a sudden our meals went from i mean i was not participating in it but our meals went from like me having fish with veggies and stuff like that um to a, a beautiful eggplant mm -hmm. parm but without real cheese and and just substituting things and trying things and so it, <laughs> so so you don't mind eggplant I love eggplant, actually. Ah, ah, ah. That's like one of the plant-based foods I cannot stomach. Really? The texture, the consistency. I find it has, almost, it's just spongy, almost no flavor. I guess it's kind of like tofu like that. Maybe it takes on the flavor, but oh yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I mean, if you think about it, I don't think I've ever just eaten a piece of eggplant by itself. So you probably, I, I would probably concur with you on that. Um but it, you know, the the whether it's at home when she's cooking, yeah, or when we're at a restaurant, you know, being in LA, it's a little easier. You know, we have it easy here because it's just a place where there's so many places that offer great plant-based alternatives. Even a place like Nobu, which is really famous for its fish, you know, back in the day, I would, I one of my favorite things at Nobu was this yellowtail carpaccio. This, the, you know and this amazing sauce that they used, which the sauce was plant-based, but, and now when we go, they just substitute with avocado. And I know that fish eaters would be like, dude, that's not a substitute. Yeah, it is. It's delicious. And it's like, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Yeah. I have, that's really the, the most interesting thing. And I, I want to know, I don't really know your journey. So I don't know how old you were or if, or if you've always been plant-based, but 
a lot of people who I talk to about this, they still say, oh, but I really miss this or I really miss that. Yeah. I, there's, I don't miss anything. There's nothing that I think about, oh, I wish I could still eat that that's not plant-based. Yeah, yeah. Most people, it's cheese. A lot of the, you know, the manly, manly guys are like, it's, sure. my, it's my steak. Yeah. I was actually just out in L.A. <clears throat> for the Expo West, and I was staying with a friend. And there's an Italian restaurant right across from Woody's uh, or Woods. I think it's called Woods. You know, Woody Harrelson's new little. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read about it. Yeah. A anyway, it, it was <laughs> it was crazy good. All vegan. Yeah. Um, spectacular. Yeah, you're right. The, the, the options in L.A. are kind of. We got it. We got it pretty easy. You know, I, interestingly enough, Australia was was challenging this time. Even in 2023, Australia was a challenge for us. I'm surprised to hear that because Australians, to me, seem like a population that have really embraced this, you know, plant based movement. They have, but you know, there's a difference between. Um, I, I guess it's just we we're a little spoiled here, or when you go to New York or mm -hmm. Austin, I know is you know pretty you guys have good, good options. It's just, it was, uh, there weren't a lot of restaurant, good restaurants. Here's the other thing is that I like to go out. Daisy and I like to go out and have a, a meal that has ambiance and a bar and, you know, and as Daisy says, so many vegan restaurants look like prison cafeterias, you know, like <laughs> I feel, we feel like we're being punished a little bit sometimes. Um, so there was, that was a little bit of a challenge, but we, we, we found uh, one of my best friends in Australia is a TV host there named David Campbell. He and his wife have been plant-based for years. He did it for health reasons. He lost a ton of weight and got really fit through, um, adopting a plant-based diet. So they took us to this really amazing place. Um, but you kind of got to know people who know the right places, you know, it's like yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. You ever use the, there's an app called happy cow. You use it all the time. Right. I would imagine so. And I, I've actually used it in Europe and Poland and it's worked extremely well. It works well. You know, I, I still tour. Uh, I don't just play the major cities. I, I still play a lot of what we call tertiary secondary markets. I play small towns. If they have a beautiful venue, I'll go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my joke is sometimes I'm in a town like, you know, just outside of Wichita, Kansas, and I'll open up Happy Cow and Happy Cow will be like, get in your car and drive six hours. <laughs> because <laughs> you're out of luck here, bro. <laughs> so uh, is that intentional that you're playing some of these smaller cities? Is I mean, I always have, you, you know, um, I think that's, I mean, I think that's more, remarkable. Not, nothing against major city audiences. Cause you know, it depends on where you go. Like I've never played for a New York city audience that wasn't mental and great, but there's something about smaller towns that just, they just seem to be a little bit more appreciative. And, I love playing the towns that don't get a lot of concerts um, as long as it, you know, the business part of it has worked out and that it all makes sense. I am totally happy, just as happy to go and play in Fargo as <laughs> I am Minneapolis or New York city or what, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I just love to play. And if I'm out on the road, I want to do as many shows as we can line up. Well, next month you're going to be in my neck of the woods. You're about uh, 40 miles down the road in New Braunfels. Right, which I'd never heard of until this gig. <laughs> Very cool place. Yeah. Very cool place. Yeah, I've heard great things about it. Yeah. But uh, when I heard that, I was like, I wonder why he's coming to New Braunfels and not Austin or San Marcos or something. And yeah. there you go. Uh, good, good stuff. New Braunfels will be absolutely, ex you know, starstruck and excited. It'll be awesome. I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Lionel Richie that you know he kind of discovered you or or noticed something in you that yeah. he thought was pretty unique what do you think that was back at at 18 that when he invited you to go out to LA with him I think it was the sound of your voice your charisma what the sound of my voice he I, it wasn't charisma because i didn't i don't know that i had any particularly i hadn't performed or anything like that i was just beginning i'd only written a handful of songs I think this says what I'm about to say it says so much more about him mm. than me. Um, you know, this is 1981. I was graduating from high school. It was my senior year of high school, and I had written a handful of songs. 
that I was able, lucky enough to get uh, recorded, demos recorded that sounded pretty good for the time. Um, but I was still just a newbie, you know, and I had sent my tape that used to be cassettes out to different record companies, got, you know, no response or rejections. Um, I, f I knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew the Commodores organization. He was still, he was just leaving the Commodores and striking out on his solo career. And somebody got my cassette tape to him. And at this, at, you know, 1981, he was maybe next to Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. the biggest star in the world, the biggest artist in the world. And the fact that he took the time to listen to my cassette tape and then on the back, I had written like in pencil my phone number and he called my parents' number. Wow. Talked to me for like 20 minutes and just was so encouraging. I said, man, I, you know, I hear a lot of tapes and you're really good. And what do you, what do you think you want to do? And I was like, well, I want to be a songwriter. I want to be an artist. And he goes, well, you can't do that in Chicago, man. You got to come to LA. And I don't know what your plans are, but you know, if you ever get out here, look me up. And when I graduated from high school, I, my father and I went out to LA to find me a place to live, find an apartment. And I called him and he was making his first album and he invited my father and me down to the studio. And he had said to me, look, I don't really, I don't know how I can help you other than just sort of encourage you. He said, I don't have any work for you. I'm making an album. And it wasn't like, Hey, come to the studio and sing on my record. I was sitting there with my father just watching and they were, they happened to be doing background vocals on a song called you are, which became a huge hit for him. And he was struggling with the blend. He wasn't hearing what he wanted to hear. He was, he kept changing parts and I could see he was getting a little frustrated. And finally he was sort of standing there and I was sitting in the, if you've ever been in a proper studio, you know, there's a big room where you do the recording and then there's glass, there's a big glass window and inside it's called the control room. And that's where the engineer sits and, and I was sitting there on this couch with my dad and Lionel looked through the glass and he pointed at me, he goes, come here. And I, I did one of those like, yeah. yeah. And he said, come out here and try this part. And he put me on the mic with these other two singers. And he'd never really heard me sing other than the tape that I had done, right? Yeah. yeah. This was a leap of faith. And, and he went in the control room and he counted us off and we sang the chorus and he went, that's the sound I need. And boom, I had a job. Like he said, come back every day, man. Like come in. And he said, even if I can't use you as a singer, um, you know, you're welcome to be here. And I, I went to the studio every day and I just learned about recording and producing. And I can't, I could sit here for hours and just tell you story after story about Lionel Richie and how gracious mm. and generous he is. And my life would look a whole lot different if I hadn't met him. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't it interesting how, it seems like a lot of us have been fortunate enough to have somebody that saw something in us that maybe, you know, we didn't see, or they kind of helped us along the way. And it changed the trajectory of our paths. A hundred percent. Yeah. I know for me, well, there were several people, but one of them was John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Food Market Stores that really? read my, my first book, The Engine 2 Diet, and then invited me to come be a healthy eating ambassador for Whole Food Market Stores and start this food line. Um, this is back in 2008, 2009. And I was a firefighter at the time. I know and it completely changed the course of, you know, my life. But and you talk about taking a brave step. I mean, that, I mean, on one hand, yes, you can say that that was a pretty bold, badass move. Yeah. On the other hand, I think because of you being a firefighter and what we all perceive that world to be it was so different and so almost like square peg in a round hole that it was it like, wait, what? Yeah. Who wrote this book? Who's promoting a plant-based diet? Yeah. And I think that that was a part of the hook that made, certainly made me pay attention. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. No, it, it was, it was one of the reasons why I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, get on the, the morning shows and the today show and all that stuff, because what? a Texas firefighter is promoting tofu instead of beef. Come on. Yes. What's, what's the story with this? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, if you don't mind, I'm fascinated. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more kind of about your career. You're, um, so you grew up in Chicago. 
Mm-hmm. Your, if I'm not mistaken, your mother was a singer, singer, and your dad had a business where he wrote jingles. Is that right? Yeah. So I mean, it sounds to me like you took the best of your mother and your father, the singer and being a writer of songs, and you blended those together. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a hundred percent. I, and you know, it's one of those things where I never experienced as a kid, I never went through that. What do I want to be when I grow up? I just knew like from the minute I could make noise, the minute I was like babbling and couldn't even form complete sentences, I was singing along to whatever was on the radio. And my parents realized when I was, you know, two, three years old that I was singing in tune. Like I, I had a sense of pitch. What became of that? Who knew what it was going to be? But there was never a question for me of, be, of doing anything else. Um, I loved music more than anything. I loved listening to records and and studying songs and memorizing songs. Plus, you know, my parents, even though they weren't in the record business, and my father didn't really quote write songs. He wrote thirty and sixty second hits mm. that sold products and. Uh, that talent, that particular talent is very rare. And like to get it right and to be successful at it for decades as he was, was really pretty remarkable. Um, but you know what it was, Rip? I, rem- I had, I don't, I don't think I was conscious of it at the time, but in retrospect, I just remember my, both my parents, but particularly my father, couldn't wait to go to work every day. Hmm. And I, I think I sensed that. And I remember just feeling happy that he was so happy doing what he was doing. And, and maybe there was something in me that thought, whatever I end up doing, I want to leave my house every day looking forward to getting where I'm going. Um, and so my, and my father talked incessantly about how much he loved what he did. And my mom w- was a great singer. And the fact that they got to sort of do this family business was really cool. And I started singing on the commercials when I was about five or six years old and grew up in a recording studio. So the transition for me to finally move out to LA, like when I walked into that recording studio with Lionel Richie, had I never been in a recording studio, everything might've been different, but I had a training. Like I was as comfortable behind that microphone in that studio as I could be. Yeah. Um, so I, so at least I was nervous and I was like, knew there was a lot riding on this, but at least my surroundings weren't unfamiliar and I, I didn't feel like a fish out of water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that yeah, yeah, growing up around two parents who were that talented, and 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 you're right, blending because my father couldn't sing. He really <laughs> frustrated him. He was a terrible singer, and my mother couldn't write. So that was a great combo that I think I sort of embodied. Did they both get to see the phenomenal success that you were able to achieve? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just lost my mom about a year and a half ago, and she had a really good run of. She was just about 86. And um, my dad, unfortunately, died when I was 33. He was 73, um, but it was a car accident. And it was just mm. awful. Mm. And he was thriving. He was healthy and, you know, still working and loving life. Uh, that was really a hard time for me. Um, not only did they see my success, they participated in it in that my, I would have my mother come and sing background vocals sometimes on my records. Oh. And my father, who was, he was this amazing jingle composer, but he was a brilliant orchestrator, conductor, arranger. Um, and so he, he did arrangements on a, quite a few of my records. But the biggest hit, of, I had this song that was a big, big hit for me in the 90s called Now and Forever. And it's a really simple ballad, acoustic guitar, but with a string quartet. And my father arranged the string quartet. And we even did that song on Jay Leno and back in the days of Arsenio Hall. And we did we did TV shows together where my dad's behind me conducting the, mm. the strings. So, yeah, we got to share in that. And it was quite a gift. And uh, and two songs that you, I think you've recently written, and I don't know if they were on uh, Songwriter or not. Uh, slipped away and and thanks to you were to your mother correct or no slipping away was actually uh, no those are older songs but slipping away was uh about my sons actually um when my sons were like 10 it, it, my sons are two and three years apart so when they were like 13 12 and 10 i don't know something occurred to me that 
they were all going to grow up soon and leave the house. Mm -hmm. And I sort of like had a wait, what, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And so I wrote slipping away and I've had so many people, uh, that song was never like a radio hit or anything, but people who buy, who supported me and buy my albums, I've had so many letters and messages about that song from parents who go, man, that just killed me because you know, you can't stop your kids from growing up and leaving and they have to, and you, you want that, you want them to thrive and go out in the world and everything, but you, you sort of left behind and it's, that song's really about that. But thanks to you, yeah. I wrote uh, as a Mother's Day present to my mom about, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago. And it was really just a gift for her. And I had the, the lyrics engraved in a, mm. in a thing that I framed for her. And she, of course, cherished it and was very moved by it. But I had not uh, ever performed it live. In, in any concert. And I did during the pandemic, you know, I did a couple of those, you know, people were doing um, virtual concerts, you know, we were doing, you know, and, and I knew that my mom's days were numbered. Um, she'd been fighting cancer for years and she'd really been thriving, like really remarkable. She was such a badass, but it was finally, you know, it was, I, we knew that it, the, the end was nearing and um, and so I did it in this virtual concert. And so I came to her bedside and propped up the screen after we did it. And so she got to see it. And um, yeah, but I've always sort of, you know, I write songs that are very personal and I've written songs about my parents. I've written songs about my sons, women in my lives, obviously. Um, that's kind of where you draw the inspiration. Yeah. You talk about how with your sons, you hit the sun jackpot. <laughs> with, your, with your with your three sons i really did yeah. um are any of them performers uh yes i mean they're mo they're all musicians and they're all really gifted songwriters singers they all play different instruments um we've done a lot of work together um they've sat in with me on 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 stage mm -hmm. um we've done some tv shows together uh, we recently just did the Kelly Clarkson show together. We, uh, they sang all the harmonies for me on this song I did on the Kelly Clarkson show a few months ago. Uh, but they're all sort of like my oldest son, Brandon, is 32, and he's a brilliant musician, but he's pursuing a photography career. Um, you know, the music business is not easy. It's, it's in some ways harder than it's ever been to really get traction. Um, my middle son, Lucas, is 30. He's the one who's the most laser beam focused on music. He's having great success. He did a, he wrote a song for Katy Perry a year or so ago. He actually wrote and produced several songs with me on my latest album, Songwriter. Um, we just had a hit top 15 single on, uh, yeah. called uh, Same Heartbreak, Different Day that I wrote with Lucas and Lucas produced. So working with him now, I just wrote a song with him yesterday. And so we collaborate together all the time. He's become my new favorite collaborator um and my youngest son jesse and i wrote two songs on the new album as well and jesse is uh, a rock artist he, he goes by a band name called mark this hour and he's got his ep out there and brilliant but it's pretty heavy it's pretty heavy rock so we wrote a couple of hard rock songs for my record and jesse and i produced it together and so yeah it's it's still a family business it's just you know a generation later that is so fantastic. So you said one of your sons was over yesterday and you guys wrote a song. I mean, do you find that with your songs, are you working on some of these songs for weeks, months? Sometimes it's the muse visits you and you write it on the back of a napkin at a restaurant. Is it just all these things? Yeah, it's, it's all those things. It's, I can't even say that the best ones happen quickly, although there is some science to that. Like the biggest songs, the most successful songs I've ever had, I probably worked the least on in terms of worked hard at them. They just happened. You know, I, I think probably the song I'm most associated with, which is called Right Here Waiting. Yeah. I wrote it in 20 minutes. You know, it was really? just, it, it just, but you know, I really am a believer uh, that these kind of things, whether you're a musician, whether you're a songwriter, whether you're an author, um, a painter, 
it it's not like I'm just an instrument. It just sort of happens. It kind of comes through me. And I talk to so many other creators who feel the same way. Sometimes it's perspiration rather than inspiration. <laughs> yeah. um, but for the most part, it's pretty effortless. Music especially is very easy. For, it's, I, I still feel like the well is very deep. Mm. I have musical ideas every day. I'm constantly singing voice notes into like melodies and stuff into my phone that sometimes become songs. Um, lyrics are harder for me because I'm very meticulous about them. So sometimes I can slave over a lyric for weeks before I'm happy with it. Um, I'm actually right from here. Uh, I'm going to go for the, I've never written with him before, but I'm writing with a brilliant songwriter named David Page today. Um, David Page was a founding member of the band Toto. So David Page wrote Africa, oh, yeah. Rosanna, Hold the Line. But then he also wrote all these other songs for different people. Like he wrote... Um, Lido Shuffle for Boz Skaggs and um, wow. Got to Be Real for Cheryl Lynn. This guy's just, and he's a brilliant keyboard player. So we're going to see what happens today. We're just going to get together and make up something. And wow. um, it's really fun. Oh, yeah. Um, I recently saw that you were collaborating with uh, Burt Bacharach. Mm. Uh, uh, and I, well, I, I shouldn't say recently. I saw that on your Instagram post. I know he passed away. Yeah. recently and it sounds like you guys had a really remarkably special relationship yeah we did but i mean to be able to collaborate with people like kenny rogers kenny loggins lionel richie burt Bacharach, i mean how wonderful and they probably feel the same way like hey we're, i'm collaborating with richard marx today baby i mean <laughs> i can't even wrap my brain around that but the the idea of getting to be not just in a room and, co and creating with these people who are my heroes. Um, Kenny, Log you mentioned Kenny Loggins, you know, when I was in high school, I bought, I knew, you know, every Loggins and Messina record. And then when he went solo, I, I was first in line to buy keep the fire. And I knew every nuance of every song. And ev I studied the way he sang all these songs. He was my favorite singer. And then he did an album called high adventure. And, and, I, and I'm all right from Caddyshack. And I was like the biggest Kenny Loggins fan. And I sometimes got accused of trying to copy his sound. And well, you know, a few years after I moved to LA, I met him. And over the years, we became really close friends. And then we ended up writing songs together and performing together. I was with him day before yesterday. We wrote a song. After all these years, he's doing a documentary about his career and life. And we wrote a song together for that, that we were in the studio working on recording. And I'm doing, he's doing his final tour. Um, he's retiring from touring this year, but I'm doing at least one of the shows with him in California. And Rip, it's like, whether it's Kenny or Burt Backrack or whoever, I find myself just going, <laughs> I'm still sort of like a kid, yeah. you know? And I just, I just feel so blessed, so grateful that, I have gotten to not only create with my heroes, but, but know them and become like Kenny's one of my dear friends, Burt Backrack and I became really close. Like we talked all the time mm -hmm. and I only met him about five or six years ago. I feel, you know, for me with Burt, it's a little bit of a balance. I feel a little ripped off mm -hmm. that I didn't get to meet him until the last few years of his life because we were just becoming great friends. And, but he was 94 years old. He had a great run and he, he knew he knew how blessed he was and great family. And yeah. we're doing a, um, a, a sort of a celebration of his life in a couple of weeks at his in his backyard with a bunch of friends. And but yeah, man, it's like I, I'm such a lucky guy that I not only have gotten to make music and have a career as an artist and performer and run around stages and make funny faces and wear tight jeans, but <laughs> but to be a creator with people who made me want to do what I do, mm -hmm. you know, to this day, I still get to collaborate with those people. And I'm really, really, really grateful. So tell me with, uh, during this collaborative process, is there much in the way of egos? Cause I know sometimes when I'm collaborating with people, you mm -hmm. know, you got an idea, they got an idea and it can get a little, it can be a little friction. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering what, 
you guys set ground rules ahead of time or you just know uh, because of the invitation to collaborate or however, however that works out that um, we're going to throw our egos aside and try and truly collaborate. It's really never been an issue for yeah. me because I think early on, um, well, I started, you know, as a songwriter for other people before I had a rec got a record deal. So when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I was writing songs with and for Kenny Rogers. Uh, I did a song with Chicago, uh, Philip Bailey, Earth, Wind and Fire. So I was getting to work with big stars. Um, I knew how to be a collaborator, how to be a co-writer. And then after I became really successful as an artist, I can still continue to work with other artists. I always wanted to stay, keep my producer writer job separate from my performer job. And I, uh, a long time ago, I decided, I, I figured out the, the, uh, the equation. If I'm going to go in a room and write with Keith Urban, for example, I've had great success with Keith and we've written three of his biggest hits hmm. and I'm a huge fan of Keith's. Um, when I get together with someone like Keith, my ego in that environment is non-existent hmm. because we're writing a song for him. We're writing a song that he is planning to record. Now, if we're writing a song for me and there's any kind of back and forth, I'm going to win that argument because it's my record. And I'll, I can do it in a polite way, but I'll be like, you know what? Yeah, I don't, I, I'm going to do it this way. I don't like that or whatever. When it comes to working with somebody else, my sole purpose for being in that room with them is to help them get what they need. And so I take my ego out of it. And I, there are times when Keith and I, for example, will go back and forth about a lyric. And he'll say a lyric and I'll think to myself, I wouldn't sing that. And then my next thought is, I'm not singing that. He is and he likes it. We're going with that. It's, just, it's really simple. You know, the, the ego thing is really, when you talk about people with dealing with ego uh, battles, it's just, it's not battles of ego. It's just battles of insecurity. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I feel very secure with my role as a collaborator. I know exactly what my purpose is in that situation. Very well said. Uh, I, I noticed that, <clears throat> One of the books that you absolutely adore and cherish is James Allen's As a Man Thinketh. Yeah. Um, do you recommend that we read it? I recommend that everybody reads it. And there is a, uh, years ago, they ad adapted it to, uh, there's an As a Woman Thinketh. Um, mm. And I, I stumbled upon it at a time um, about 10 years ago when my life was really changing, I was married for a very long time, raised my kids and was in the process of getting divorced and being single really for the first time in my life. Um, and I was floundering a bit. I was, a, I was, it was a rough time. Um, like everything that I had become accustomed to and everything that I was comfortable doing was different. Had, had been changed and I was forcing myself out of my comfort zones and I was, I was chasing curiosity instead of shunning it. And, um, and I stumbled upon this book, which you can read in an hour tops. And it was written, I think in 1906. Now I'm not somebody who, uh, look, if you're really into manifestation or the secret or that stuff, I'm not, I, even the way I said it, I know it sounds like I'm dis dismissive of it. It's just not my cup of tea. Um, but As a Man Thinketh by James Allen was written in 1906, and it really deals with the, the, the thing that's interesting to me, which is that the quality of your thoughts dictates the quality of your life. And if you have shitty thoughts, you're probably not going to have a thriving, wonderful existence. And I realized that I needed to clean up my thinking. When it came to myself, I was, I was very self-critical. I was insecure about a lot of things. Um, and my thinking was preventing me from being happier. When I read that book and I read, read it over and over again, and I've given it to, I've given that book as a gift to so many people. It really did 
changed things for me. It shifted things for me. And it always is a reminder, you know, it's a, it's an easy thing to fall into where you just get down on yourself or you start to feel negative about the world or, you know, especially the last few years between COVID and the political mm -hmm. discourse. And there's just so much awfulness out there that we're bombarded by, right, on a daily basis, that it's easy to get caught up in negative thinking. And this is just always a really good reminder for me to shake that off and, and pay attention to the quality of my thoughts. Well, not only you, but everybody else that's out there. I think I, I read somewhere or somebody told me once that we have roughly 62,003, you know, thoughts during the day. And of those 95% are negative thoughts Yeah, right? where we're bashing ourselves or whatever. And so as a man thinketh, I will be reading. Yeah. I think you'll really love it. Yeah. Fa fantastic. Um, when you're on stage, do you have a certain routine that you go through beforehand as far as a meal you like to eat? Like, are you wearing sneakers, jeans, a certain button down shirt that you like to wear? Uh, or is it just whatever? Well, one want. of my favorite things about being a, a solo performer is that I, I, it's just on the fly. I don't really have a standard, like I see, uh, I love Chris Martin and Coldplay, but I, when I see them, I like, it doesn't matter whether they're in Buenos Aires or in Sydney or in Denver, Chris Martin's wearing the same thing. <laughs> and that's fine. It's like, and he even talks about his uniform or his, you know, I, I, I just kind of go with whatever I feel like throwing on, on the day and could be sneakers, could be boots, could be, sometimes I feel more, a little more retro. Sometimes I want to dress it up and I'll put on a jacket with a pocket square and like a dress shirt, like it depends on the day, but I don't really have like rituals like a lot of performers do. I don't, I've never warmed up. I don't warm. I mean, I really should start doing that at, at 59, <laughs> But my voice has just been so Teflon. And if I'm healthy, if I'm not uh, sick or under the weather, my voice is, pr is just resilient and I never even think about it. And also, you know, especially in my solo acoustic show, which when I hear the word solo acoustic show, I immediately get bored just to hearing the, <laughs> the, just hearing the description because I've seen a couple of solo acoustic shows by great artists and I was bored out of my freaking mind mm -hmm. because it's, they're just saying like, okay, and this is what I was going through when I wrote this next song. I'm like, dude, I don't care. I don't want to be entertained. And so my, I, when I'm, I'm always a little nervous when I say that my solo acoustic show, because my solo acoustic show is like if I had you over to my house for drinks and I just, and it was a guitar and I just told you stories and it's funny and it's like very interactive and it's goofy. And, um, and like I said, you know, I have a martini on stage and that's my only ritual is that I have a little, I have a little bit of uh, uh, you know, a, a little ceremonial swig of my martini before I walk out. I have one on stage. It's very loose and, and laid back, but I don't do any other kind of rituals and I don't eat before the show. I like to hit the stage hungry. Yeah. Um, partly because I think when I have eaten anything before a show, you, know, you get that, you know, you know I, I gotta be holding long notes. I, I can't be like, now and for it, you know, I, the audience doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I don't eat until after the show. So you don't have a request for five eggplant parmesans in the green. <laughs> <you are>. <laughs> <laughs> but but in all seriousness, do you have like you you've been doing a ton of touring lately? Do you have a request for the green room, like like all vegan or plant based or certain things? Yeah. Oh no no. Of course. Yeah. And that's easy because it's not a democracy. Um, it's not a band. Even with my band, um, they have what they want because they're not. I don't know if anybody else in my band is plant based, but they they go with me. If I say, hey, I'm going to this cool vegan place, they, they're with me and they find stuff that they love and they're really fascinated by it. That they're just not all in like like I am. Um, but my dressing room has only plant based. So I don't have a lot of. I'm not a snack kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I don't eat a tremendous amount of food. First of all, I, I sort of, you know, I'm pretty economic, economical about that, but um, it's pretty easy. And 
you know, I wish I could make up some, you know, that we, you have to remove the brown vegan M&Ms or, you know, <laughs> like, there, there's none of that. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned your voice and how you almost have like a Teflon voice. You haven't, you've been very fortunate like that. Do you have insurance on your voice in, in case something was to happen to it? That's a really good question, Rip. And I, years ago, I went through a period where I was getting sick a lot and I wouldn't cancel shows. I've, I've canceled maybe a handful of shows in my whole career. And I, ha I have to be really kind of like halfway on, on my deathbed to cancel a show. But um, it did come up as maybe something I should do. <clears throat> but to be honest with you, I, I just, I'm, my voice has just been so yeah. there for me that it seems like a waste. You know, I, I, and there's sometimes if I'm not, if I'm feeling a little under the weather, it, whether if my voice is not a hundred percent, you know, one of the things that uh, is helpful for me is that I'm, my voice has always been very raspy. I don't have this beautiful, pure tone. I sound like, you know, the love child of Rod Stewart and Brian Adams. So <laughs> it's not like anybody's expecting some pristine, you know, if my voice is a little ragged, it's just more character to that particular performance. It's, you know, my voice doesn't give out on me or crack or any of that stuff. It's just sometimes I have to duck certain high notes on a particular night or whatever, but it's really not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so I, I grew up seeing a lot of concerts at yeah. Boston Music Center. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but the one person I never saw was Rod Stewart. You mentioned that you have seen him more than anybody else. What do you love about Rod Stewart? Well, I mean, I was, I loved Rod Stewart's songs. I mean, when I was growing up and then I went to see him in high school and I was just sort of like, I didn't realize that how funny he was and how he was just different than anybody else. I mean, he, he's got a little, there's some similarities with Mick Jagger a little bit, but with Rod, he's just so unafraid to be whatever, goofy. And he sometimes he'll move in a way that's like super cool. And then on the next one, he'll move in a way that you're like, dude, what are you doing? Like, are you having a fit? Are you, you know what I mean? But he doesn't care. It's like, he's just having fun. He's having a laugh. And his songs are great. I think he's one of the most underrated songwriters. People don't give him credit for the songs that he created. Tonight's the Night and... Young Turks and on and on. Um, Maggie May. I'm sexy and you want my well, I mean, he, Come on, I mean, he, No. <laughs> he he, he uh, grimaces at that one. Oh, he does. Uh, he does. <laughs> he goes, that's a piece of garbage. But he said it was a huge hit. It totally changed his, his life. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just started. I would always go see him in concert. And then. I met him years ago. We were both backstage at an American Music Awards show and I met him and I remember just thinking like, it was, I kind of wanted to do one of these things, but it was very brief and he was nice. Was like, hey man, how you doing? And then I ran into him. I, I actually spent a little time with him, very little time with him, but we shared a, a guitar player, a guy who played guitar in my band for years. And then I took a lot of time off and he ended up touring with Rod and we're still all friends. And, um, and he became ill about a dozen years ago. And so he's totally fine now. His name is Don. Um, but it was a pretty scary period of time. And he, it was very challenging him, for him financially. So Rod and I put together a benefit to help cover some of his medical costs. Mm -hmm. And so I could see him there. And then we, and Rod and I did a show together in Atlanta about five years ago. And so in Australia a week ago, I was finishing my tour and I had been mentioning Rod Stewart for almost 48 hours in a row. Somebody at my meet and greet at one of the shows in Sydney asked me about who have I, of all the people I've worked with, who have I not worked with that I always wanted to. And I said, Rod Stewart, I never got to, I always wanted to write and produce a song for Rod Stewart. It didn't, didn't happen. Next day, my drummer says, who have you seen in concert more than anybody else? Rod Stewart. I talk about some of the tours I saw of Rod Stewart. We're going to this restaurant in Perth that night. And we're walking, my band and I are walking, Daisy's with me, and we're walking into this restaurant and my guitar player looks down and he says, dude, those shoes are amazing. And I was wearing these cool like retro black shoes with white 
they're leather, but they're 30 years old. I got them 30 years ago. Yeah. And they're uh, like, sort of like Elvis used to wear these shoes. You know what I'm talking about? The two-tone oh, yeah. kind yeah. of loafers. And the la and I said to my guitar player, it's funny, a few years ago, I did this show with Rod Stewart. And when we saw each other in the hallway, we were both wearing the same shoes. And so I said, I've had these for like 30 years. And we have that conversation. We sit down at the table and Rod Stewart walks up in Perth, Australia. That is hug each other. We ended up the next night hanging out and having some drinks together. And it's just, you know, that's my life. You know, it's just great. <laughs> And, and I, you know, and I, I finally did get to really spend some time with him. And we were in, you know, we ended up, Daisy said, oh, my God, it was so cute watching you and Rod sitting in the corner, just laughing and, and like having your arms around each other and telling each other stories. And he's just he's awesome. Uh, let me ask you this question. And let's just like this is pure vanity. But what is besides your voice? What is your favorite feature? Uh, on me? Yeah, on you. Uh, feature, physical feature? Yeah. I guess my eyes. Uh, you know, I think I've got pretty eyes. Uh -huh. At least that's what many people have told me. I, I, you know, Rip, we're going to get into a weird thing here because, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm so self-critical. I, I only see the stuff that I don't like, gotcha. especially getting older. I know I, and I, I have not done anything yet i don't know i'm not going to say whether i will or not i don't know i'd i'd be kind of surprised if i did something if i had any kind of surgery or anything like that um but i don't knock it on other people i see some i think it's tricky for men i think sometimes it really alters the way a, a guy looks but then again there are some celebrities especially older guys who were who look amazing because they've done something I just don't want to be that vain. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to be that. I don't want to worry about it. You know, I feel like I need, I, I'm much more concerned about what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. And if I pay more attention to that and I stay fit and I stay healthy and, and I'm, you know, look, I'm madly in love, you know, that's a, that's a youthful, <laughs> that's like the best youth serum there is, is just to be madly in love. And um, beyond that, I just sort of do the best I can to sort of look after myself. But yeah. especially in the, it, the the town that I live in and the industry that I work in, yeah. it's it, you can go crazy. And I, I, I'm not interested in doing that. Yeah. yeah. No, well, listen, I, I appreciate that, that answer. Um, what about you? What do you think your, your best feature is? Well, I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you that in a second. But, <laughs> but because it's funny, I look back on you know, your videos. I listened to, Oh, you were going to the hair. Oh man, that, that hair. It's like, Dude, you're so lucky. How lucky are we that we have this? I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, it's like Ted dancing and cheers, right. You know, <laughs> exactly. but your hair, I mean, your hair in all your videos and everything like that. It was like, mm, yeah, baby. <laughs> well, I've, I've been follically blessed as have you been, but I admire you more because if I didn't put a little, if Daisy Fuentes didn't rub yeah. some hair dye in my hair every few weeks, it would be that color. Wow. Wow. No, for me, it would be my back, my back, kind of the, my back, the musculature of it. Yeah. I've had, um, you know, not that I look at it that much, but I've had different women, tell me that they love my back and so that's what, what it is it's like whoever yeah. comments the most on your whatever now you are very fortunate in that you're already a grandfather i am yeah i am i am not i've got like you i've got three three children i've yeah. got a, a nine-year-old daughter a 13-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son i got married when i was almost 44 so wow a lot later in life and I just, I have to remark on this because I loved your sense of humor in this. You, <laughs> you, you were visiting your granddaughter and you asked her and her two friends, <laughs> oh, yeah. who is your favorite singer? And I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> they said Harry Styles and The Weeknd. The Weeknd and Bruno Mars. And That's right. Such a betrayal. <laughs> and you're like, you looked and you're like, that's bullshit. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened was I was visiting my granddaughter uh, yeah. in Miami. We, we yeah. live, Daisy and I have a place in Miami, so we, we were there part time. And uh, my granddaughter, Maddie, and her family have a place in Sunny Isles, which is nearby. And she lives in Chicago most of the time, so I don't see her that often. But we were definitely wanted to get together it was the, during the Christmas holidays. And so I went over and she had her friends visiting with her. And they're all about TikTok, right? And mm -hmm. I'm kind of still new to TikTok, but I had a pretty good following from the get-go. And I've, I don't really feed that beast as much as I should, but it's fun, you know? And Maddie, my granddaughter, said to me, we were we were talking. We were thinking, do you think we could do a TikTok with you so we can get more followers? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sure, but let's do something fun. And so I came up with that. And uh, oh my god, for the following week or ten days, all three of those girls were texting me. They were, they'd get you know they get oh, I got five more followers today, or I got eight more followers in the last hour, and it's it's so so cute. Yeah. Yeah, no, that whole TikTok beast, uh, that's something I've st stayed away from so far. <laughs> you know what? You got to just, I think, you, especially for somebody like you, you can use it in a way that suits yeah. you, that's fun for you. I can't, I'm, I can't get into the whole trends mm -hmm. that are happening. I just, if I think of something that might be funny, or if I find a clip from a show or something that I think people might like, I'll throw it up there. But mm -hmm. it's like the biggest posts I've ever done on TikTok, I think the biggest one, one of the biggest ones was recently I was with Kenny Loggins and we were writing this song for this project that he's doing. And I was sitting in his music room and he was, we were working on lyrics, but it, and he was on his phone and I know he was working on the lyrics, but it felt like he was just gone. Like he was not in the room with me. And so I did this video where I showed him behind me and I was like, this is what it's like writing songs with Kenny Loggins. I'm here working and he's like on eBay or something. Yeah. yeah. And just that little clip blew up. Like, like I think it's sort of like people don't see people like Kenny Loggins in that situation. You know, he's just a dude in his music room writing a song, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, at the end of the day, we're all just, you know, dudes and, and gals and, you know, yeah. human beings. Yeah. Um, living in Miami, have you crossed paths at all with Dan Butner? Yeah, well, I know Dan. Um, and I know he you were just on his podcast. Uh, I've had Dan, I've had Dan on my podcast probably three or four times. Every time he writes a new book, we he yeah. we, we bring him on. <laughs> uh, Daisy and I met Dan about uh, five years ago. And had dinner with him, and we have seen him a, a few times since. So we're in touch. We're mostly like, like you know, modern times. We're more in touch probably on Instagram messaging than yeah. than in actual real life. But um, I think Dan's a really really cool guy, and I I love what he I I love his books. I love the the cookbooks. I love I love his philosophy. Um, I think he's a really really good cat. I really yeah. like him a lot. He's a good cat, and he is a, he's an adventure seeker, too. True. Yeah, very much so. And I, he's easy to be around. He's just really easy to be around. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that, you know, we keep threatening to spend more time together. It's just sort of, it's it's been weird, you know, the last few years when he started to spend more time in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, we would hit each other up every once in a while. Hey, we're going to be down there. He's like, oh, I'm leaving on Thursday. So we keep doing this, but I would I would love to spend more time with him. Yeah. Uh that's what we should do. We should we should line up a hang, you the three of us. Well, are you playing pickleball yet? Yeah, I just started. Okay, okay, because that's that's a great great way to hang. Is yeah, pretty. agreed. Um, when you're in the kitchen, you and Daisy, mm -hmm. who's taking the lead? Oh, her. I'm just her. I'm just I'm just choosing the the music on Sonos and making her a drink. Oh. But it's fun, you know. I really love that. Uh, I love that time. I love when she's because she she's not someone who's just a good cook who just sort of she loves it. Like she really enjoys all of it. She I never see her get impatient or frustrated or she just loves creating a meal for us. And I love just being in there to hang with her and we talk and we listen. Sometimes we listen to music. Sometimes we listen to a podcast. It's uh, 
it's a really fun date every time she makes dinner, which is more than half the week, you know, she cooks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am only recently getting a little bit more adventurous. Um, I'm pretty good at making breakfast. And I've what's, always had a breakfast. My favorite breakfast is a tofu scramble or I, sometimes I use just egg because um, it's just so easy. Mm -hmm. um, but I love to just sort of doctor up a nice scramble or a, a, a burrito. Um, we, my favorite breakfasts tend to be, both of us tend to be more savory. I'm not, like I love pancakes and waffles, but I just never eat them. I, I, I want something savory in, for breakfast. So you're not, so you're not an, uh, an oatmeal fan? Per se. I used to be. I lived on oatmeal for most of my life, and I, I just hit a wall with it. Daisy still eats oatmeal, and I know how good it is for me, and I probably eat oatmeal now once every month, and I need to get back into it. That's a, I know you're big on oatmeal, right? Oh, big on oatmeal. I'm so damn. I also, yeah, absolutely. I also, you know, I've got a commercialized uh, cereal. Uh, huh? It's called the Rips Big Bowl. I'll send you some. Tell Please. Me yeah. I want to know. Yeah. But if I'm going to do oatmeal, I got to doctor it up. I got to throw nuts in there. I got to throw some peanut butter or almond butter. I got to, you know, a lot of berries. Yeah. Um, it's got to be a hearty, can't just be oatmeal for me. Well, when I do, whether it's oatmeal or whether it's just cereal, uh, I kid you not, uh, Richard, I have, I mean, I got ground flaxseed meal on there. I got, yeah. I got hemp hearts. I have some walnuts. I have usually it's frozen fruit because it's just always perfect. And I throw it in the microwave for yep. 30, 45 seconds, but I got mango chunks. I got berries. Um, I do usually do a fresh banana. I love kiwi. I love grapefruit. Mm. So I usually have at least three different types of fruit yep. on, on my cereal bowl or, or oatmeal. And it's a game. Cool. Dude, I only just realized that there is frozen avocado. <laughs> I had no idea that that was a frozen thing. And we, I saw it in the store the other day and I saw, I turned to data. I literally went like this. I went <sighs> like, what are we doing? Like, and it's not bad. It's just not like, it's not like fresh, but it's still, it's a good alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we all live on avocado. I have never, never seen frozen avocado in the store. What store were you at? We were at a place called Bristol, Bristol Farms. Okay. Here in LA. Huh. Huh. So I'm asking you this question on behalf of Dan, Dan Butner. What bean is your best friend? Baked. Baked beans. Baked beans are my favorite, especially for breakfast. Like I like a, it must be a, there must be part of me that's British because my favorite breakfast is a nice piece of sourdough toast. Yeah. Some avocado spread on it. And baked beans on top. That's breakfast. That's my favorite breakfast. Like I can do that all day. Um, but I'm like, I'm not uh, anti any bean. I'm a, I'm a big fan of yeah. there's not there's none. There's no bean. That's not my friend. Yep. Well, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the common denominators of all the blue zones. Yep. That, uh, that Dan has studied. Uh, yeah. That's great. Uh, and, and most Americans are not consuming beans whatsoever. You know, no, we live, uh, you know, chickpeas um, and uh, kidney beans, black beans, a lot of black beans in this household, um, red beans, you know, like we that's probably the most consumed food group on a weekly basis mm -hmm. for us. You guys usually do canned or do you do it from scratch? Those beans usually canned. Yeah. So do we. So yeah. Do we. yeah. Yeah. No, listen. No judgment there, right? Well, it felt a little judgy. Right? No, it was <laughs> not. It was not intentional. And for everyone listening out there, I don't care how you get your beans, just get them in. Yeah, totally. You know, one of the things I'm so impressed about you, Richard, and um, and your wife is that how you guys you're out there and you're you're vocal about your lifestyle. You're not mm -hmm. just kind of not talking about it, but you're you're talking about it. And I'm just wondering, like. Is that just because you believe in it so much and you want, you know, others to, to know? And if they, if it resonates with them, then that's great. Yeah, I think it's that. I think it's like, I mean, it's not just a plant-based diet or a plant-based 
philosophy. It's like anything. Like if I, uh, I think even yesterday I heard a, when I was driving back from working with my son, um, I went on Spotify. I do this. I, you know what New Music Friday is? I don't. It's a feature on Spotify where they just put new songs that have come out in the last week or so. Mm-hmm. And there's this new Taylor Swift song called All of the Girls You've Loved Before. And I hadn't heard it and I listened to it and it was like, wow, talk about craft, man. This chorus is just killer. <laughs> And I took a screenshot of it and I posted it because I, when I hear something or see something or experience something that I, that fires me up, I want to share it. I want people to know. And I, you know, that thing to me, that's what having any kind of platform is about is Mm -hmm. um, talking about things that matter. Obviously Um, I've been pretty vocal about not, I don't even consider it politics. It's just sort of like human decency. Um, but I love to turn people on to new music that I've heard or a movie that I saw or a TV show or a book or whatever. And I think that being um, plant-based and how much we enjoy it and, and the experience of it is something that we just have always wanted to share with people. It's amazing the pushback you get. Like, oh, it's like, cause we're never, we never do it in, in an instructional way. Like you need to, or you should, or it's never that. It's just like, Hey, th- we just, we just, I mean, it's, it's amazing the hate that we get if we, you know, post something about a great plant-based thing, we'll get, you know, I mean, look, 95% of the comments are, Oh, that looks great or good for you or whatever. But there's always the 5% or like, if we all went vegan, the animals would take over the world and we're meant to, we're, we're built to eat meat. Like, dude, yeah. Just stop. You, what about your sons? What's, have they followed at all down that path? One of them, one of them uh, has been, I'd say 98% plant-based for about four years now. Um, the other two enjoy, they're like happy to go to any vegan restaurant with us. They're happy that they love Daisy's cooking. Um, we hang out all the time. Like my three sons, they all live near us and they're my best friends and they, and they're Daisy's best friends too. Like it's a very harmonious, wonderful thing. Um, but the other two are a little stubborn, you know, they're, they're like, I want to eat what I want. I want to, and I don't push back on it. Yeah. You know, they, they can eat whatever they want. And I say that I feel that way about anyone. Um, when I've had conversations with people about and maybe you've done the same thing. <laughs> I don't care what you eat. I'm not trying to convince you of anything or, you know, the only thing I will go hang on a second is when people make blanket statements like it's not normal it's not natural we can't survive on you know or where do you get your pro you know you i I would go plant-based but i i need protein like comments like that are just uninformed that's when i go time out can can i tell you a few things just so you know i'm not saying you should do this i'm just saying that you're you're basing your decision on misinformation you know Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of misinformation that's out there and you know, the, the more that we're staring at this climate change in the face and the more you realize that. And the and the figures vary from a low of 18 percent to a high of close to 80 uh, percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions that are caused by animal agriculture. Yeah, that's pretty compelling, too. If you don't want to do it for yourself, then let's do it for, you know, yeah. f- future generations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least listen to the stats. And if, you know, if you're, if you're skeptical, then do your own research because you're going to find the same thing that we did. And if, and if you find something different, see where the study was funded. Yeah. yeah. You know, like if it was funded by the, by the meat industry, then you might want to, you know, raise an eyebrow on that one. Yeah. You mentioned um, TV shows. Is there anything in particular you're watching right now that, uh, that you're enjoying? Yeah, we're we're not huge TV watchers or movie watchers. Um, we're more doers than watchers. But um, we started watching this show on Amazon called Daisy Jones and the Six, and it's loosely based on 
uh, the, uh, on Fleetwood Mac. So it's set in the 70s, that sort of Laurel Canyon, mm -hmm. Southern California pop rock, a band that's incestuous where everybody's kind of screwing each other and uh, there's drama and there's romance and... Um, and the star, Daisy Jones' character, is played by Riley Keough, who's Elvis's granddaughter. Mm. And she's really, really great. She's, I'd never seen her act before. She was really, really good. The cast is great. And for me, as a musician, there have they're, they're been so many movies and TV shows that are based upon the music business that I've just been like, that's not how that goes. That's not what happens. That's, what is that? This show is sort of like, it's fairly accurate. And... Um, we're really enjoying it. So I would definitely recommend Daisy Jones and the Six. Um, yeah. We started to watch, you know, everybody's been talking about The Last of Us. Have you seen that? Yeah, I'm, I'm up to date on that one. And then there's one other <laughs> that I got sucked into. Um, and it is, ah, it's dark. Yeah, The White Lotus. I don't know if you've heard anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. We watched both seasons of that. Okay, okay. Well, that was, I mean, that draws you in. Yeah, <laughs> for right? sure. Wow. I really loved the first season more than the second season, but yeah. Um, the well, thing about the yeah. last of us, we, I was finally like my sons, especially were like, you have to, you guys have to watch it. So we night before last, we sat down and we started episode one and it got to the point. I'm not giving anything away for anybody who hasn't seen it. This is really early in the episode, like 20 minutes into the episode, you realize what the show is really about. And it's this sort of, kind of chase scene it's very suspenseful where they're trying to es like escape and daisy sitting next to me and she goes turn it off i it's too much anxiety i can't watch this <laughs> and i was like what she goes no i can't i can't and i was like all right i guess i'm gonna watch this by myself well i've had more and i i agree with this but i've had more people tell me if you don't want to watch <clears throat> i think there might be eight um eight shows in the season but watch don't episode watch, three. Watch episode three. Everybody said that. Yeah. My son, Lucas, said, I, and he's, this is, you know, he's a very uh, thoughtful, um, soulful dude. But he's, he's also pretty stoic. And he said, Dad, I bawled my eyes out. Mm -hmm. Like sitting there alone in front of the TV. He said, I was crying. I was like, Oh, that sounds like fun. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I know I have to watch it. Yeah. I mean, the fact that the writers, the director, everybody could go in this direction is yeah. kind of like a timeout. Yeah. It was so powerful. Yeah, I've heard it. It's great. such a beautiful, a beautiful moment to me in, um, in TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you get the name Richard? Well, I was named after my father, with different middle names. My father uh, was, as I mentioned, you know, he was very talented, but he was also very well known in Chicago. So he started out as a jazz pianist and got a big following. And he was sort of like the, the, the cool dude in Chicago jazz in the 50s. And then I came along in 1963 when he was starting his jingle company. But he was like, we would go out to dinner and people would come up to him. Like he was known in Chicago. Yeah. And as I got older, I decided, and I've told this story on stage many times, that because, and he went by Dick. His name was, he was known as Dick Marks. And I said, I knew when I was very young that I was going to be Richard because Growing up in Chicago, I knew that my dad was well known. And if I wasn't Richard, he would forever be known as Big Dick. And we know what that would make me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I went with Richard. Got it. Well, my real name on the birth certificate is also Richard. Oh, I did not know this. We're yes. brothers. Yes, we are. We are. We're both Richards, you know. So when you get dicks, down to it. A couple of dicks on the <laughs> podcast. Yes. Yes. You know, I, I tour with Rick Springfield every so often. We've, do, we've done a bunch of shows together. We've been friends for a long time. And I nicknamed the tour the Two Dicks Tour. The Dick Squared Tour. Yeah, yeah, nice. Uh -uh. All right, we're winding down here, but if you don't mind. Oh, like man, to, it was just getting good. I'd, I'd like to ask you kind of an esoteric question. Okay. And that is, 
we've, you and I have both been on the planet almost the exact same amount of time. I was born in February of 1963. You were, I think, September 1963. Yeah. What do you think happens to us when we die? Oh, that's a good question. We, we, uh, I have this conversation a lot. Um, okay, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I don't think I've ever discussed this publicly, only with, uh, among friends and family. I was, um, up until I was about late 40s or 50, I was, um, I was never what you'd call religious, but I definitely had a belief and a faith in God, whatever that was. And, and it was sort of traditional. I wasn't particularly, I wasn't a Bible follower, but I appreciated it. Um, I didn't come from that. My family, my father's side of the family was Jewish, although we never, he, he wasn't a practicing Jew. My mother was Presbyterian growing up, but she wasn't, she didn't go to church. We weren't a churchy religious family at all. Um, my ex-wife and her family were very, very religious, and she still is, um, Southern Baptist. So I was exposed to the, a lot of that and the Bible and church and all that stuff. Um, but I had an unshakable faith in God until my late 40s, and I started to ask myself more questions. And over a period of years and reading and meditating and conversations, I finally decided that I am what I call an agnostic atheist. Mm -hmm. um, there's no such thing as an, as an atheist or a believer. You're an agnostic no matter what, because no, none of us know. Mm -hmm. um, so I own that. I feel like really comfortable in that. But it was, it's such a different daily experience being an agnostic atheist and not believing in a I believe in the universe and I believe in energy and, all, you know, I could go on and on about it. But the answer to your question is since adopting this belief system, I believe that when we die, it's just lights out. I don't think there's anything after. I don't believe there's no evidence to suggest otherwise. And the people that say, yeah, but what about people who had near death or they died and they were brought back? Their brain were still functioning. It could have been a sense of a dream state or power of suggestion, any number of things. Here's the, here's the thing, Rip. When I think that, let alone say it, I know that sometimes it's like, oh, how sad if that's it. Mm -hmm. Not to me. Because when I started to really believe that it's just lights out at the end, this moment and in five moments from now are that much more important than they were when I believed in some extra thing. I really believe it's all about now. I really believe that it's just this ride and I want to enjoy it the most I possibly can. I want to love people hard. I want to like, I want the people who I love to know how deeply they matter to me. I want to have amazing moments with strangers and family. Mm -hmm. And I want to just, I really believe that like, yeah. So you're, you just turned 60? Just turned 60. Okay, happy birthday, and I'll be 60 in September. And look, if we're lucky, we've got, you know, maybe another 25-ish summers to enjoy. I'm not wasting them, man. I am especially believing what I, the way I believe. It's all about, like, enjoy that meal, man. Like, really be in the moment and taste that food and laugh at everything and hold her hand more mm. and tell your people how much they mean to you. That's what I believe. I like that. I like it all a lot. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. Um, well, you've had quite a ride these first 59 years. Congratulations. Way to live large, dream big, produce all kinds of fantastic stuff to share with the world. You know, you're, uh, you're doing great things, Richard. I really appreciate you coming. Thank up, you. Coming same same to you, man. I really, I, I feel exactly the same way. Congratulations. Yeah. Keep on keeping on. Keep it plant strong. Done. Boom. 
For all of Richard's upcoming tour dates and announcements, visit richardmarks.com and continue to support this humble legend. And, oh yeah, I'll have Daisy on soon to discuss her own personal journey. Until then, keep rocking it, my plant strong friends. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Plant Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Kryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.